I'm Dave, and welcome to Zalagamoto, the channel where I've taken this insane desire to collect every English language Master System, Genesis, Sega CD, and 32X game, and not just let them rot on IKEA sh bookshelves, but oh no, 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 we're going to do in depth reviews on all these bad boys. If that sounds interesting to you, I encourage you to subscribe, as I upload one of these videos once a week, usually on Monday or Tuesday, but every now and then there might be bonus videos as well. Collecting just to collect. That's not really me. Whether it's video games, music albums, video game music albums, comic books, whatever. If I buy something, it's not just to sit in some glass case and look pretty and never be enjoyed. Oh no, no, this stuff is actually getting played. Except for Action 52. It, it can go to hell and die. No, that's, that's a lie. Even Action 52 will have it stay in the sun, whether it deserves it or not. But today is not that day. Now instead today we're looking at a game from the console that you could say is the most ignored of the four that this channel is based around, as in the previous 113 episodes of Zalagamoto, I've only ever looked at one game for the 32X, and that was Star Wars Arcade back in episode 50. And before you think, oh, he's avoiding the 32X on purpose, no, 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 I'm not. It's just that there's so few games for the console that if I'm really trying to do a balanced schedule with all four console libraries, I'm only ever going to do one or two games a year from it, or else I'm going to run out long before I run out of games for the other consoles. So, let's get into it with this week's game, Motocross Championship. Motocross, if you're not familiar, in incredibly simplified terms, is a sport where riders on dirt bikes drive around a traditionally dirt course that has lots of ramps and other hazards to jump over and avoid, and usually events will have multiple races or heats to determine who qualifies for a main event that has the best placing racers from the previous events. Sometimes the courses that are competed on are in a stadium setting and sometimes they're outdoors. It just depends on the event and the organization. And then there's also a few different divisions with bikes in each division having smaller size engines up to more powerful ones with usually the smaller engine bikes being for the less experienced racers. Growing up, my first exposure to motocross was watching the Mickey Thompson off-road racing series that was broadcast on ESPN in the 80s and early 90s. You're probably more familiar with this series by way of Iron Man Ivan Stewart Super Off-Road, which was of course famously popular in the arcades, and I reviewed the Genesis version back in episode 11 which means I was supposed to review the Master System version three episodes ago. Oops. I guess this will do instead. Anyway, while the big draw of the Mickey Thompson series was the Grand National Sport Trucks, events would also feature buggy and motocross races as well, and in some track layouts, the motocross races would clearly outshine the trucks due to their enhanced ability to fly through the air with the greatest of ease, and of course the occasional horrible crash landing. Motocross would go on to become its own thing and as the Grand National Trucks series died off and was a staple of the early X Games events with stars like Jeff Ward, Ricky Carmichael, and Jeremy McGrath who got his own series of games on the PlayStation and other consoles. As a result of this growing popularity of the sport in the mid-90s, Sega of America released Motocross Championship in January of 1995, which made it not quite a launch title for the console, but still a relatively early release. So, how is Motocross Championship? Is it a diamond in the rough that is the 32X library? Or is it a title that's best forgotten, much like the console has been as a whole? Well, we'll see, but first, a look at the package. And here's my copy of Motocross Championship. But before I get into that, let me point out this acrylic box that it was in when I bought it. I picked this up at the Midwest Game Convention in Milwaukee a few years back, and as you can see, it cost me just $10. Yes, that's right, a complete 32X title for $10. And even with the crazy price changes that have gone on during the current pandemic, you can still find good condition copies of this game in the $20 to $25 range, which should give you some indication of how the meat of this review is going to go, but it also speaks to the fact that this was one of the earlier 32X releases, and as such, there's simply more copies of it out there going around. As far as the condition of this copy, it's in pretty good shape. Unfortunately at this point, Sega was using the cardboard boxes for all of their Genesis and 32X releases, 
So that's what we get, hence the acrylic outer box. But thankfully, that protective box appears to have done its job, as while we've got some wear and tear here and there, and a little scuffing up at the top, this is in great shape. The cover art is fantastic with this particular shot, and the logo is solid as well. It's got a KA rating at the bottom, indicating as for ages 6 and up, and frankly, that doesn't seem accurate. Let's flip it over and see if there's an explanation. And yes, here it says mild animated violence. Here's why I have an issue with this, and I'll go over this in more detail during the control section of the review, but the various riders in the game can punch or kick the other riders to attempt to get an advantage. Now, I don't know about you, but having photorealistic bikers punching and kicking each other seems like it should merit slightly higher than six years and above, but what do I know? Moving on to the rest of the back, and I really like this more modern layout that's used here with the faint reproduction of the front picture, and then all the flavor text on the top selling the game. And this flavor text does do a good job of selling the game, and the bullets down below are nice little checkered flags. Looking over to the left, and we've got four good quality screenshots, with one even showing off the split screen style for two player mode. And you might think, hey, they're a bit grainy for good quality, well, as we'll get to in a bit, that's actually how the game looks, so the screenshots really can't be any better. Finally, at the bottom, like most 32X releases, this one lists its megabit size, as that was important at the time, and I've got to be honest, not really feeling the power of the 32X with only 16 megs, but we'll see if that really affects things. Moving on to inside the box, and I've already pulled these out because it's a pain to do in real time, but here's the cartridge, manual, and warranty reply card, all in really good shape. One of the switches that Sega made when they went to the cardboard boxes was that the manuals moved to this blah Xerox black and white rough paper stock, and it just seems cheap, even being in good condition. The manual itself is decent, it explains the game and has some screenshots thrown in, but what's more interesting to me is the rear cover, which is being used to sell other sports titles on the 32X, including College Basketball's National Championship, which was only ever in development for the 32X, and was cancelled without ever seeing the light of day in any form. Which is too bad, because I'm really curious as to if it would have used the NBA Action 95 engine or not. Also, flipping the rear cover open and, what's this? Ron Barr? Yes, apparently EA didn't renew his contract, so he jumped ship and threw in with Sega briefly. This was really weird to see, especially after having seen him in several EA Sports games already on the channel. Okay, that's the package. Let's get to the game and see just how much of a snow job that flavor text on the back of the box is. A game designer, or I guess any kind of artist, knows that when they've created something, that if it's really great, people are still going to talk about it 30 years later. Yeah, some things can definitely be considered popular when they blow up on release, and maybe tons of people jump on the bandwagon for a brief amount of time, but if it just fades away a few months or even years after its release, is it truly great? To me, anything that's truly great is going to have that staying power. For instance, with gamers, it's something that people are still going to make magazine articles about and want to play even though the graphics aren't up to current standards, and perhaps encourage many sequels in the series. Road Rash is one of those titles that I think qualifies as something that was truly special, and I think that bears out with the first game in the series getting a 4 star rating when I reviewed it back in episode 14. In fact, I really should be reviewing Road Rash 2, or the Master System version of the first Road Rash, in this spot on the schedule. Oops. Apparently Dave from two years ago forgot to schedule out all these sequel reviews in advance early on, as we've seen twice now so far. However, it's pretty appropriate that I'm reviewing Motocross Championship in this spot, and actually kind of eerie as this was totally unplanned, because the reason why I'm bringing up Road Rash is because it seems like the designers at Sega wanted to make a Road Rash on dirt bikes. Well, that sounds freaking awesome, you might say. Motocross plus Road Rash? I'm in! Well, to quote Lee Corso, not so fast, my friend. 
While the idea is great in theory, and I'd love to see a true road rash on dirt bikes, this isn't that, as there's some pretty basic problems that crop up immediately to get in the way of that sort of masterpiece. The first issue you run into is the control scheme. How do you manage to mess up the control scheme to a driving game, especially when the aforementioned road rash works so well? Well, I'll tell you. Things start out normal enough with the A button being used primarily for brake and the B button being used for gas. However, then we get to the C button. Like in Road Rash, the developers decided it would be a good idea for you to defend yourself physically and be able to separate from the competition, and the C button is used for that. However, in Road Rash, the game is intelligent enough to detect which side to attack on, and then if you want to modify your attack, you can hold up or down on while hitting C, which all works well. On the other hand, in Motocross Championship, you instead have to tell your rider which way to attack, with C defaulting to a punch to the right, but if you hold left, then you get a punch to the left, and then if you hold down, it turns into a kick to the right, and then if you hold left and down diagonally, it becomes a kick to the left. Yeah, I don't know who decided this was a good idea, but it's pretty insane, and honestly, you'll be better off just trying to avoid the other bikers as much as possible, for reasons I'll get to in a minute. Also, keep in mind that this game was released in January of 1995. The six-button controller for the Genesis was released in 1993, about the same time as Street Fighter II Special Champion Edition. So, with the six-button controller having been the de facto standard controller for the Genesis for over a year at this point, why on earth does Motocross Championship not support it rather than require these awkward button combinations? I just don't get it, and it just compounds an already confusing design choice. Along with the incredibly odd control scheme and choice to go with a basic three-button setup, even if you completely ignore the C button, and the A button as well since you won't be doing much braking, and Good luck having time to try to pull off the stunts. Just simply getting around the tracks can be difficult as well for a few reasons. The first problem is the lack of an on-screen mini-map of the track. When racing around the track, unless you can manage to memorize the course layout, you're effectively blind as to what's coming next. Before you start a race, you're presented with a nice pseudo 3D look at that particular track, which is good, but unfortunately that interest doesn't do you a whole lot of good once you're in the thick of things and are trying to fend off 11 other bikers. Compounding this problem is the extremely close-up rear view of your biker. In Road Rash, having a similar view isn't a problem because while there's some jumps in the track or other bikers to run over, for the most part your bike will be sticking to the ground. However, in Motocross Championship, this isn't the case, as every track features a multitude of different jump layouts, and the dirt bikes are designed to jump high in the air. And to be clear, it's a pretty great feeling when you hit a jump at full speed and go rocketing over the track. It definitely feels reminiscent of watching a sport on TV or in person. Well, at least until it's time to come down, and there's a corner that you weren't aware of due to the lack of the aforementioned minimap. And with the camera being zoomed in so far, that when you really hit a jump well, the course disappears underneath you completely. In these scenarios, again, the best you can really do is end up out of the course a few times until you can finally learn to let off the gas before that specific jump. Visibility issues with the track pop up in another scenario that will cause plenty of wrecks, and that's regarding the various mud puddles that might appear around the track. Now, I certainly haven't watched every motocross event ever shown on television, but usually having mud puddles in a track is a sign that it's not being properly kept up, unless it's a specific obstacle that's usually much bigger than just a small spot. However, the designers of Motocross Championship decided it would be a good idea to place mud puddles in each of the tracks at various points to give the riders something to avoid. Unfortunately, they also decided to place a lot of these puddles directly in the middle of the course during turns, especially during later tracks. This causes the same visibility problem that jumps have, but rather than being a vertical issue, it's now a horizontal one, as you can't see the puddle coming until it's too late to avoid it in many cases. Also, the puddles can be extremely wide from a hitbox perspective, 
meaning that even if you know one is coming and you navigate to the inside or the outside of the turn to get around it, you might still hit the very edge when making the turn. Making issues worse, hitting the puddle is almost an automatic crash and the only way I was ever to avoid going down was to let off the controller completely and pray. My last major complaint about the game, and don't worry, I've still got some minor ones too, is the hit detection. Earlier I mentioned how it's probably in your best interest to avoid the combat mechanics of the game and just try to avoid the other riders whenever possible. The reason for this is that any kind of contact with another rider doesn't necessarily cause you to crash, but what does happen is that you slow down to almost a standstill. I'm not exactly sure how the physics works on that, but you can be literally riding down the course at 50 plus miles an hour, and the second another rider contacts you from the side, or comes down from a jump on top of you, you slow down to an almost standstill, requiring you to have to accelerate up to full speed again, and possibly be passed by a host of other riders in the process. Due to the rubber band AI that the computer opponents utilize, it's not uncommon at all for you to see you go from being in a qualifying position in third place and drop all the way down in ninth after a single incident. I totally get losing some momentum, but this is something that should have been corrected in playtesting. I find the best strategy to try to stick to the outsides of the track, avoiding any potential computer opponents running up the middle, but then that can be dangerous due to the course visibility issues I just mentioned. As far as an actual game structure, this is something that I like. Sort of. The game allows two modes of play, practice and season, and each allows you to pick one of three different difficulties. Season mode is where the heart of the game is, and has you start out in the 125cc bikes, run 12 races, and then migrate up to the 250cc series, and then finally the Superbike series, giving you a total of 36 races to try to make it through. When playing in single player to advance to the next race, you have to finish in the top three spots, or else you have to try that track again. And track 10 is especially a pain in the ass to try to get through. At the end of 12 races, you see how you did in the money compared to all the other computer opponents, before it moves you along to the next segment. However, here's another part of the game that just seems cheap. From one race to the next, you have no idea how you're doing compared to all the other racers, and it just ends up being a surprise at the end. I've never seen a racing game that doesn't have race race stats for a season mode. As you might expect, it will take you a while to progress through all 36 levels, especially when playing on the more difficult modes which feature races with more laps. However, thankfully, with it being 1995, the designers decided to include battery backup. <laughs> I'm sorry, let me stop lying. No, actually the game has no battery backup. And instead, if you want to pick up where you left off, you get to enter an 11 digit password consisting of upper and lowercase letters and numbers. Yeah, you might be better off clearing your calendar to try to go through it in one go. But be warned, I spent three hours on the easiest mode and still only made it just over two thirds of the way through. Finally, the graphics and sound are one of the reasons why people are so critical of the 32X. This simply doesn't look or sound like a 30-bit title. The sound issues with the 32X are well known as it's still relying on the Genesis underlying aging FM synthesis, but the graphics aren't anything special either with it just appearing to have slightly more colors than your standard Genesis title. And speaking of colors, for some reason out of the 12 riders on screen, you'll oftentimes have the same coloring as a computer biker, which can be confusing for obvious reasons. With all the colors available to the 32X, this should never happen, and it's just plain lazy. The game does appear to use the 32X hardware for proper sprite scaling, but that's not anything the Sega CD or Super Nintendo couldn't do. In fact, I'm pretty certain this same game could run on Super Nintendo with better sound. That's how non-32-bit this is. Motocross Championship is one of those games that I had an interesting time with, as far as attempting to judge it. When I played it early in the week, it was a near disaster as I didn't know that you needed to hold down on the D-pad for all jumps, and not just the whoop de doos and as a result, I had a hell of a time trying to be competitive. The manual could definitely have done a better job explaining this. 
However, when I went back to it to record the game footage, I figured this out, and then it briefly became fun, and then ultimately it became more frustrating with all of its issues, because I could now see where the framework of a good game was. When researching for info about the game, I came across a bunch of review scores for the title, with most of them being from back in the day, and surprising to me, most of them being pretty favorable. And I do try to rate these games with the lens of not 2021, but with something closer to what they deserve in general, taking into consideration all of the limitations at the time. But even for 1995, this game is just simply doesn't measure up, and all I can think of is that the reviewers at the time were maybe overlooking some of its flaws just because it was new. Had the game played exactly the same, but been more full-featured, I would have given it two stars, but it really feels like something that Sega just threw out onto the market to have something else in the fairly barren 32X library. As a result, I'm giving it just one star, and this is why complete copies of the game are still so cheap. Alright, that was Metacross Championship for the 32X. So far, with the first 32X games I've looked at in Star Wars Arcade and Motocross Championship, I've definitely seen why the 32X wasn't more successful. But hopefully as we get to the other 37 games on that list, there'll be something that makes me go, okay, yeah, this thing was actually kind of cool, as I'd hate to think that it doesn't have any redeeming games. Although, I have to say, in the case of Motocross Championship, it really seems like the issues with the game weren't the fact that the hardware in the 32X was limited or misused, although it certainly didn't look very next-gen, but just the fact that the designers made some very questionable gameplay choices and that possibly the design process was rushed to get something stripped down to the market. Next week on Xylogamoto, we'll return to the less exotic library of the Genesis, but wait, actually this is going to be somewhat special is I'll be reviewing a game that came out this year. Yes, that's right, next week's review will be a Genesis slash Mega Drive game from 2021 where the developer actually saw what I was doing with the channel and asked if I would be interested in taking a look at it. And to be clear, I paid full price for the title, so you'll know that my opinions are my own as far as it's concerned. I'm definitely looking forward to giving it a shot. Please remember to subscribe if you like this video, and remember, Whatever you like to play, have fun, and be excellent to each other. Later!